do scribal arts only go into the calligraphy level or illustrative level on one part, typically. While historically we did have some illustrations of different texts, the vast majority of scribal art basically took place with what we call ketubot, marriage certificates. And I'm going to start out with that because it is the one place where Jewish art comes in rather than just a scribal's work, scribe's work. We've got about 20 copies, and that's about right for everybody. There are two pages. Um, one shows different ketubot, and the other one shows one historical one. Basically, the ketubah is a marriage contract. It is the only one where the scribe was allowed to actually use a lot of discretion. They didn't have to follow specific ritual rules and laws. They could embellish. And typically what would happen was the scribe would write the center part, which not in Hebrew but Aramaic, the language that was in common usage at the time of Jesus and was the language of the people at that time. It became one of the two religious languages in Judaism. Much of the Talmud, the Jewish book of law that is the exegesis of Torah, the five books of Moses, is written in Aramaic, not Hebrew. I always like to tease my students who are learning for bar and bat mitzvah that they're now learning a third language. They've studied a little bit of the Hebrew, they've studied, and they know English somewhat. Uh, <laughs> and then they get to also understand that a large number of the prayers they're starting to work with are not Hebrew. It's Aramaic. So the marriage contracts are all in Aramaic, except for the bottom section. Now, when I say the bottom section, and this is one I'm going to pass around, you will notice there is a top section up here and then the bottom down here. In this particular one, the top section, by the way, this is one that was from Cochin in India. You've got two pieces up here from Cochin, India, which is one of the reasons I particularly wanted to bring this in and show it to you as an contrast a little bit. These two were written on, one is Kabbalah, Book of Jewish Mysticism, and the other one was an, basically an instruction on how to write and create an amulet to ward off the evil. Uh, in this marriage contract, you're going to see it's a little bit more finished, mo a little bit more refined, and the other part was, I started to say that at the very bottom of many of the marriage contracts, and this book has quite a few actually, it's the only thing in the book, uh, good example right here. You've got a top piece and then down below you're going to see in a different writing and different concept. Top is Aramaic, it's the legal formula for the contract, saying that the bride has bringing this much in her dowry, the groom is matching it, and in case of a divorce, the bride gets it all. Down below is something that is much more interesting in many respects. It's what we call tanaim, conditions. And that is where the parties have agreed under certain conditions that this is what's going to happen in the marriage, and if it doesn't happen, there are grounds for divorce by either party, depending on what the conditions are. My favorite one in here, by the way, is one from Amsterdam, where obviously very wealthy individuals were getting married, and the husband wrote in that if she loses the household keys, it's grounds for divorce. Now, that was in the 16th century. Household keys in those days were not keys like we think of today. They were large. They were typically around the size of your forearm. And it included the keys to the strong room. You didn't have a bank. Everything got put into the strong room, and the wife had the key for it. And so the husband was saying, I'm trusting you with everything we own. If you lose the keys to this thing, <laughs> that's it is showing tremendous irresponsibility, and he was willing to, to put that in the Tanaim. Some of them are really funny. Some are culturally unusual. There was one written in the 12th century from 
uh, one of the Arab countries, and I don't remember if it was Morocco or Yemen, where it said he could not take more than two other wives. This was his first wife, and she, she basically said, I'll, I'll share up to two, no more than that. And for those who are not aware, polygamy in Judaism was allowed up until about the year 1000 for what we call the Ashkenazic Jewish community, at which time Rabbi Gershon of Germany wrote an isur, a prohibition, and said, no more, one wife, that's it. But the Sephardic Jews, particularly the Mizrahi, what the, we call the Oriental Jews, and that doesn't mean what we typically think of as Orient, it means those from the Arabic countries, were not included in that prohibition. So up until the 1950s, when the Yemenite immigration took place with magic carpet, they still had multiple wives. And if you go to Israel today, you can still meet some from the Yemenite community who have more than one wife. So this Tana, within the conditions, comes from that period where they were having multiple wives. I'm going to pass this around just so you can briefly get a look. Let's talk for a moment how the documents are actually created. One, with the exception of the Ketubah, which was never written on parchment that we know of, the holy things whether it was a Megillah, which is a scroll, and when I say a scroll, you had five books in the Torah, in the Bible, which were referred to as scrolls, Megillot. Esther, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. They were all written like this. They were written the same as, way, in the same manner as a Torah is written. Particularly, the scroll of Esther was used by scribes who were learning to be scribes. The reason for that is, in the book of Esther, God's name does not appear even once. So this became an easy one for those who were practicing and were not quite finished with their apprenticeship, but almost it almost became the test case to see if they were ready to write a, a safer Torah, a book of Torah. The book of Torah, we have one example over here, is a very exacting, and by the way, for those who are interested, we'll pass it around. All these are written on parchment. The parchment has to be from a kosher animal, meaning choose cud, split hoof. It has to be specifically prepared and specially prepared with ritual levels. No metal can touch it. The cutting is done typically with a bone knife that is, and today now they're using plastic knives. Uh, but the idea was metal was seen as an instrument of war. Now, last week when I was here and I heard the talk, she was explaining about the uh, professor who was explaining how the ink was made and so forth was talking about iron gall. And I explained, in Judaism, we couldn't use that. Iron gall actually has metallic composition. It makes the ink last much longer, by the way. Since we're not allowed to have any metal touch the Torah or the things that are considered sacred, we had to use an alternative, gall nuts. So typically in the old days, they would take a mixture of tar, oils, and wax, and boil them. They would gather the vapors as it was boiling, and that would be mixed with honey and olive oil, and that would form the ink. And they would add charcoal to the mixture to create the black. The ink had to be black. In fact, even today, if you have a Torah scroll where the ink is starting to fade, and it fades to a brown, it has to be repaired by going over those letters again. Writing a Torah scroll is tremendously complicated. The man who's going to do it, or the woman, 2003, we had our first female scribe that we can actually authenticate. 
Pre previous to that, no woman ever became a scribe because of Jewish prohibitions. Now we have several within the more liberal branches of Judaism, but none in orthodoxy at this time. The scribe, one has to go to what we call a mikvah, ritual immersion, every day that they're going to write on the Torah. You cannot do any of the writing from memory. You have to have what we call a tikkun, a book in front of you with the exact number of words, columns, and spacing that you're copying. So in some respects, you would see it more as a copyist than typically thought of as a scribe. The pen has to be from a kosher bird. No metal. So it's a quill pen, which is called a kolmus. By the way, if you've never written with one, not as easy as you think. <laughs> we understand now, if you've ever tried, you'll understand immediately why we switched over to metal nibs and got rid of the quills as fast as we could as the you know, science developed. I go to my notes for the exact figures because my memory is not what it used to be. Let's see. I did just drop, here we are. There are 62 to 84 sheets of vellum in each Torah scroll. The weight can vary from, say, a, a low weight of about 10 pounds up to 75 pounds. This becomes an issue because part of the ritual during the service involves what we call hagba, which is raising of the Torah. and has to be raised up like this and three columns exposed. When you have a 75-pound weight, and imagine for a moment that it's going to be totally unbalanced, because depending on what part of the year you're in, you may be in Deuteronomy, you may be in Genesis. So if you're right-handed, you are hoping that if it's unbalanced, you're being called up during Genesis. <laughs> I'm sorry, just the opposite, during Deuteronomy, uh, where all the weight's going to be on the right hand. It doesn't always work out that way. And for our bar mitzvah kids, some of them who are not all that big, they're hoping, because they're going to carry it around, that it's one of the small scrolls as well. For that reason, in modern time, only in the last 30 years, the smaller scrolls have become more expensive. It used to be the opposite. In fact, many families in Europe prior to World War II used to commission small family scrolls. The wealthier families would commission one. Even the less expensive ones at that time, comparative values we would use in today's dollars, it would have cost about $40,000. A Torah scroll written today on an average costs somewhere between sixty dollars to 100000 That seems like a lot until you hear that it takes approximately a year for the scribe to write it. Now, if you're trying to earn a living by being a sofer, the name for the scribe, you're not going to want to wait to the end of the year before getting any money in, so they take to doing a couple of other things on the side to help out. One of those things is creating tefillin. Tefillin, in English known as phylacteries, I've never understood the term phylactery itself. I, you know, I started out with tefillin. Who knew from phylacteries? First time I heard it, I wanted to know what that was. We find a commandment in Deuteronomy chapter 6, to wear these words between, as frontless between our eyes and as a sign upon our arm, upon our hands. Every morning, an observant Jew will put these on. These two, part of a set, would be the ones put on. These are open because I had to inspect them. And since I can open them, but I'm not skilled enough to close them up again, they are staying open until the sofa a scribe comes up to visit us, and he will close up the several that have been opened to be inspected. Inside are 
pieces of parchment. And this is how the scribe gets the weekly money. It's the same writing that you will find in the Torah, the same writing that you found in the scroll that I passed around, the same method. The ink, vegetable-based, obviously, along with charcoal from the gall nuts. No metal touches it. The boxes, while it may look like they're wood, they're actually leather, again from the kosher animals. I mentioned 62 to 84 pages, sheets. They're sewn together with the sinew from those kosher animals. Very often they'll take a piece of the parchment that's not written on and use a glue made from the hooves of those animals to reinforce the fastening. I don't know if that one's turned so we can see any of those, but uh, you'll have to trust me if it's not. There are four times in the Torah that the tefillin are mentioned. And so you, in the one for the head, we have four sections. Now in the one for the arm, we chose to put them all together. One solid scroll. But all four sections are in there. This is where they make their daily Together with, how many of you would recognize this if it was on the doorpost of a house that you were heading to? It's called a mezuzah. Mezuzah actually means doorpost. So somewhere we changed the place where you were supposed to place it to the actual name for the item you're putting up there. The item, this is, by the way, not the important piece. In fact, the reason you see so many different ones is because it's not important. People will pay, and I find this interesting on a modern basis, tremendous money for some of the fancier ones, and then go with what we consider a non-kosher insert. The insert is called cloth, which is actually means sheet. Same term that we use for the sheet of Torah that's going to be written on. The cloth is a parchment. On it is that section of Deuteronomy, which says you shall put this on the doorpost of your home and upon your gates, and be reminded about them as you walk about, when you go home, when you rise up. It's all there. In the ancient days, we know they didn't use a case on it. They would literally carve out a niche inside the doorpost and place the parchment inside the doorpost. In Germany, it was done very frequently with just a small scratching on the doorpost of the, the concrete stucco or whatever was over it to mark where it was placed. And it was done that way because, and throughout most of Europe, by the way, anti-Semitism. You didn't want to advertise that it was a Jewish home, even if it was in the Jewish ghetto. So they did it but the old way. They placed it inside the doorpost. And that may be why we ended up calling them as Zot. They were placed inside the doorpost, so that which was going to hold it was, became known as the doorposts, even though it's now something separate. The... Making of a Torah takes about one year. During that time, it has to be made by somebody who is ritually pure and observant of Jewish law. Every time the name of God is written down, there has to be a blessing said saying this is being done for the sake of God's glory. I'm going to pause there and see if there's questions before I go on. This? No, the, the boxes. The boxes. Just, These are the tefillin themselves. They hold those pieces tefillin, of parchment. Tefillin? Tefillin. tefillin. Phylacteries. Uh, if you look and you, you'll see that one is divided into four sections. Mm -hmm. And it looks like, as I said, it looks like wood. It's not. Mm -hmm. Which you notice when we open it up. You will mm -hmm. see it's leather. Okay. Hardened and painted. Where does it, where does it go? You wrap it around something? This one gets wrapped around the arm. Oh. Remember I said that one? It goes right over, if you're a, left, if you're a righty, it goes on your left arm. Gotcha. If you're a lefty, it goes on your right arm. Okay. The interesting part about this, 
One of the prayers we say when we put them on is, olam, I will betroth you to me forever. The understanding in Judaism is that when you put on the tefillin each morning, you are literally betrothing yourself to God again every morning. Now, why do you think you need to get betrothed every day? I mean, most of us choose to betroth and marry one person. We don't feel like we have to keep going through the ritual every day, right? It's a prayer, challenge, the challenge of life. Every day you have challenges, right? Every day you're going to violate the betrothal. If you're betrothing yourself to God, the understanding is you're not going to be able to keep absolutely faithful even for 24 hours. You're going to violate something that God said you're supposed to be doing by the mistake or on purpose. And so each morning we start again with a fresh promise of commitment that even if we are imperfect, we are committing ourselves to a relationship with God. And that's what these represent. They are done specifically because the commandment is there within the five books of Moses. There's twice in Exodus, once in, and definitely Deuteronomy, and I believe the second one's also Deuteronomy. Uh, one is chapter 6 Deuteronomy, the other one's chapter 13. And it's not the Deuteronomy numbers. Uh, if you guess, we don't do much memorization of the text itself. <laughs> I had another question about the ink. Yeah. You said that it has to be black, and why is it? And when it fades to brown, it has to be. It has to be renewed. Renewed, right? Why? There, if it cracks, it has to be renewed as well. Remember, it's all natural. Because as it fades, it might start to resemble another letter. The, the letter, the black was the, I don't have a really good reason to give you other than the historically and tradition, it, 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 the original requirements of what has to be in the Torah is written down in Talmud. This is what's required. And one of the requirements was of black ink. Mm -hmm. I believe it's because red was seen as a product at that time of an insect. I know that today we can come up with different dyes, mm -hmm. but back then the basic red came from cochineal, which is a beetle, a non-kosher insect. And so I think what they were doing was it has to be black. Don't go into the other inks that are available because they were not coming from a kosher source. Uh, it used to be that the sofer, the scribe, would make his own ink. We've at least gotten past that. They, can, they have to make their own pens. But they don't have to make their own ink anymore. There are groups that actually make it up and sell it. You can actually go online and get sofer ink. I have a bottle of it in my drawer to make minor repairs that I feel qualified to make. Uh, but it's one less thing that the sofer had to worry about. I saw a question. Yeah, uh, demonstration possible? Uh, <laughs> Not with this set because they've been opened and because I don't have the strap. Show a picture? Sure. Oh, yeah. As long as Irma gets her phone out. Yeah. <laughs> that will show it. Uh, the binding on the head literally goes in two places the box, literally right here on the forehead between the eyes, because it says frontlets between your eyes. The knot for the head one goes into a small depression at the back of your skull. If you all feel, you're going to see the skull goes into a very small depression. That was considered the place of wisdom. And so the knot had to rest right there. So that wisdom and sight. The one on the arm is bound over the muscle. Because it says, with all your might. With all of your heart, which, by the way, heart in the ancient days meant intellect. We think of heart as seat of emotion. They saw it as the seat of intellect. Emotion was referenced by mouth, which makes some sense if you think about it, because where do we emote from? <laughs>
Then you wound it seven times, going from elbow to wrist, representing the seven days of creation. The part that went on the hand was wound in such a way that it formed Shin Dalad Yud, three letters of the Hebrew alphabet. <laughs> <coughs> Very often on a mezuzah, you'll also see shin dalajud or just the shin. In modern time, Jewish modern time, for the last 250 years, we've accepted that this represents Shomer de Latot Yisrael, the guardian of the doorways of Israel. However, when we put it on the hand, we know that's not what it's representing. It actually represents a name for God that is given in Torah by Abraham, El Shaddai is one of the names of God that Abraham mentions. So we spell out Shin Dalajud, emphasizing who we're betrothing each day with the name between our middle finger, the ring finger, and the hand itself, the palm. All of this is a daily ritual. It used to be that women were not included in this daily ritual. Again, modern days, for the last 35 years, conservative Judaism made a ruling women could put on tefillin, and I know several who do every day. The original ruling said that women were not allowed to because it wasn't commanded of them. That never made sense to me, by the way, on many levels, mainly because if you think logically, just because you're not commanded that you have to do it, where does it written that that means you can't? doesn't. Same thing with writing a Torah. Women were told, specifically in Talmud, they cannot write the pieces for the tefillin or the mezuzot. That had to be done by a man. Why? Here's an interesting part. You remember I talked about Judaism originally started with polygamy? You all know this, right? Abraham had multiple wives, Jacob did. Isaac's the holdout, he only had one. Is it because of Leviticus that women are unclean? No. Unclean? Because that would simply be a ritual that you'd have to go through the mikvah, the ritual immersion. She'd have less time to do it. Those who are sofers have fewer days that they can write the book of the, the Torah. But the, the Torah is the holiest object we have. So why would they be told they can't write on the tefillin or the Shema, on the uh, insert for the uh, mezuzah? And the answer is going back to polygamy. A woman could not have multiple wives, uh, could not have multiple husbands. A man could have multiple wives. If you're betrothing yourself to God, but you're already betrothed to your husband, that was not acceptable. You'd be entering into a second marriage. So women were not allowed. Is there any spiritual person leader in Judaism? Like Christianity has Jesus, there's Buddha, you know, like that, or is it just God? It is just God. Judaism believes that there is a personal relationship with God, that the Torah, the five books of Moses, are the, is the covenant between us and God. And the rulings within those says, I shall be your God, and you shall be a dedicated people to me. The concept there was, and again, this is part of the whole thing of writing the Torah and so forth, that he has to do it very specifically, and, and it's never done for the sake of what we call parnasah, for livelihood itself. It's done for the glorification of God's name. The concept and the belief and the philosophy has always been that there is a personal relationship between God and the individual. We have prophets, we have great leaders of the past, but there's always been a personal relationship. Whether we deal with Moses or somebody further down the line, like Maimonides, one of the great rabbis and teachers of the 11th century, we deal with this the Torah, the, the Word of God, continues to be revealed each day. 
Revelation is an ongoing process. Within the five books of Moses, there's a specific concept there that says that we don't need somebody else to understand what God is requiring of us. It's in Deuteronomy in a portion we call Nitzavim, towards the end of the scroll. It says, this teaching that I give you this day is not too difficult for you to understand, not too hard for you to follow. It's not up in the heavens that you need somebody to go up there and bring it down to you. And it's not across the sea that you need to send somebody across and bring it back to you. It's within you. Remember I talked about your mouth and your heart? It's exactly the words used. Between your belevavcha in your heart and in your mouth, I have given you the understanding of what I require of you. Now that's in the five books of Moses. Our understanding of that is God says, we did not need a Jesus or a Buddha or anything else. We had within us, given by God, between intellectual and emotional understandings, what God requires of us at any point in life, at all moments. The tefillin, the mezuzah, the Torah, they're all there to remind us just of that. Besides being betrothal, commitment to every day, it was a reminder, a mnemonic. The mezuzah on the door, a mnemonic. As we passed out and we came back in, we were supposed to reach up, touch it, and remember that we're not supposed to go about after the desires of our eyes and the stray thoughts. We're supposed to actually have a higher calling and moral, ethical requirements that are guide us throughout all of our lives, at all points. The scribe had to be somebody who actually serves as an exemplar of that to the community. It doesn't have to be a rabbi and often is not. Common misperception is that rabbis are the scribes. Well, they may look like people's popular perceptions of what a rabbi looks like, unlike me, but they didn't have to be rabbis. All of them apprentice. The t period of apprenticeship can be anywhere from a year if they're really, really good, unusual, but m that would be the minimal. And I know of one who apprenticed for seven years before being passed. And again, the way you pass is you, get, you have to give proof that you're able to do this, following the rules, following the guidelines, and making it all through. What's interesting, by the way, and you should be aware of this, is Hebrew is written in what is called Assyrian script. The Assyrian script is what we typically look at and see Hebrew letters. I wish we could take credit for it as the original, but we understand that it actually predates us. Hebrew has a slight deviation in itself from different locations. So if you have a Yemenite scribe writing the Torah, it will be obvious because of the way the letters are formed. They'll be, it will be easily read by anybody who reads Hebrew, but you will note the difference. I believe there's a piece, ah, there is. There is a Megillah here on display, which is written in the Sephardic writing. And if you look carefully at that writing, and then go look at the Torah, you will see the difference between Sephardic and Ashkenazic immediately. It's not so much that the letters are going to be dramatically different. It's not, it, it's slight difference in fonts, if you will, is the best example I can come up with. Uh, in the Torah, very often you'll have tagim, little crowns, decorations on the top of the letters. That's up to the individual scribe. It will be used to actually emphasize certain words. You will also note that in some cases you have elongated letters. That's because it had to be copied. You had to have the exact number of words in each column and in each line. If you look carefully, you will note that there's been a scribing so the lines are all clear and straight. A straight line is used, but remember I told you no metal can touch it? Anyone want to guess what they use? 
It's either a reed or it's a bone from the kosher animal. And it's the tool that's made for that. You don't write on that other than the actual words of the Torah, the five books of Moses, but to get the line straight, you use the item to give yourself the line. Most columns have 42 to 49 lines. It depends on which, there's different schools of scribes and they have a different count, if you will. In both cases, though, you will end up with exactly 304,805 letters from start to finish. I told you I have to refer to my notes for the exact numbers. <laughs> um, The Torah is the five books of Moses. We consider that the laws that God gave us, 613 commandments. Everyone refers to the Ten Commandments. In Judaism, there's a little joke there that if you're only following the Ten, you're in big trouble. <laughs> you got 613 of them. And we also like the very first one as an important one. We said, what's the very first law God gave to people? Be fruitful and multiply. Therefore, we have a different perspective of sex within a lawful marriage than many other branches that came out of Judaism. And that is, if God commanded it, it's not sinful. It's only sinful if you do it in a sinful way. Hedonistic, without care, without thought. But if it's done within the confines and parameters of marriage and a, and a committed relationship, then it's fulfilling one of God's commands. Even if one partner is not fertile. That this was a gift God gave to people. I'm fond of using the example of saying, if you went home to visit and your mother spent hours creating your favorite dishes, maybe days, because you've been away for a while, and you get home, and the first thing you do is you drop the suitcases off and say, Mom, I'm going out with friends. I won't be home for dinner. And tomorrow night I have another dinner appointment, so I won't be home for dinner then. And, of course, I'm leaving the day after that, so don't worry. How do you think she feels? She went to all the effort to create the things that she thought you would have great pleasure in. God created sex as a gift to people. And we're told that if you don't take advantage of that gift, it's sort of insulting to God. It's doing like you would to your mother, telling her bye. <laughs> so we see that as a gift and as a positive. Can it be misused? Absolutely. And often is. We know that. We don't have the concept of original sin. It doesn't exist for us. What we have is many other sins. How do you get rid of them? Real simple. We even define sin a little differently. You have to have the intent to correct what you've done wrong and action based on that intent, even if it's not successful. Because in the five books of Moses, it says, I will forgive you your sins if you repent. The misconception that you had to make a sacrifice, not there. That was a different concept. So the scribe, is supposed to convey the law to the next generation and continue it. How accurate can they be? Remember I said you had to work from a tikkun, from a sample before you, you could not do it from memory. We actually have a really good idea of how accurate it can be. You do know that when you print books, first printing, second printing, third printing, you will sometimes get errors creeping in, slight typos, slight mistakes, differences. In the Torah, we know that the ones that were found from 2,100 years ago at the Dead Sea are the exact same as the ones we're using today. Not a single dot or dash that is different. So for at least 2,100 years, the scribes have been really good about keeping 
it clear, precise, and accurate. I would presume to believe that previously they were just as good. These, this is mostly from Christian based. When you get over to, I know for sure it's this, I'm not sure, yep. Starting here, you've got Jewish theme, and I believe the one item of Jewish theme, other than that is right here. Everything else is Christian based. Uh, Judaism did embellish certain texts. The Haggadah, the book that we use for Passover, one of the more famous ones was among the first printed and was heavily embellished and artfully done. Um, and today, there's such a huge number of them that it's almost impossible to choose by, for some people. I choose based on the commentary and on. Uh, others choose it based on the art. Both work. Uh, but when we deal with scribal art, the only scribal art we've ever had in Judaism was always based around the religion itself and specifically with the religious documents which meant we had only one person in each community really doing it. Um, it seems to me that they would have to make a mistake as they were doing this. How would they correct that? Ah. Parchment, vellum, skin of an animal. It can be scraped. You can actually remove a layer of skin just like we can occasionally. I don't know about you, but I do it regularly. You get a scrape, but it doesn't bleed. You just got a, a minor scrape where you got some skin lost, but it didn't go through all the layers. Same thing. Mistake is made. The ink has to be permanent. So if the mistake is made, the only way to correct the mistake, and you're right, occasionally it does happen. It gets scraped off, but not with a knife. Bone. And again, in today's world, we have a new substitute. Plastic. How long did it take to prepare the vellum? Did it take days? No. I have been told, and thankfully I don't do this, the vellum has to be prepared in a very specific manner. The, from the time the animal is slaughtered to the time that the vellum is ready to be used takes about two months. It's a process that could be speeded up if we use other things and chemicals that have been used by others. But unlike tanning, which was often done to prepare parchment in the medieval period, even the Dark Ages, we did not allow the use of urine. So you had to find other things that would prepare the skin. It would be polished on one side at least completely, and stretched. So it, it's an involved process, and that's one of the things the SOFR did not do. And by the way, when I mentioned 60000 to 100000 as a price, it sounds really expensive until you think almost 15000 of that is going to go to the cost of the materials alone. They often write at home, uh, so yes, they can write at home. They rarely use a synagogue to write at. Too many uh, disturbances, distractions. There are specific places in B'nai Barak and in Jerusalem, there are two in particular ones that I'm thinking of where they actually do a training for scribes officially. And those, if you walked in, you might be a little bit taken aback because you've got a lot of little cubbies lined up and each one has one person and the door is often closed to that cubby as he's working. 
Uh, recognize that if the scribe has to get up to go to the bathroom, as an example, before he can sit down again, he's got to go through about a half hour ritual cleansing before being able to resume work. What do you mean cleansing? It's not just the washing of the hands. There has to be prayers said, there has to be a change of attitude, mind. It, it's supposed to be the concept of coming back to the sacred work at hand. That when you had to leave it for that moment, you leave it mentally as well. And you have to bring it back there. So there's a whole process of prayers and ritual washing above and beyond just washing your hands that takes place. There was another The chants go up to this corner are all Christian origin. And they were written by the scribes just exactly like No. That. Christian scribes did it totally different. They used metal when they could. When nibs came into play, I think, in the 16th or 17th century. I'm not an expert on that part of exactly when they started, but I know that before they got to fountain pens, you started out with metal nibs, basically. Oh, I see. And they started doing that. In Judaism, we never accepted that because, again, the difference was we were dealing with, for the most part, ritual items that had to forego any touching of metal. Metal being an, the concept of representing war, therefore it had to be from the natural source of a feather quill. Yeah, I, I do know for a fact that stone can be used. Typically isn't, but can be. Uh, there is a, there's a seventh century guy uh, from Susa, the great academy in Babylon, who speaks of using an obsidian knife to cut the parchment. But it was not typical. And maybe it wasn't typical because obsidian wasn't as easily and readily available to everyone. And so they went more with the bone. Getting the bone from the animal that you are going to be using the parchment and the sinews from in any way, that could be sharpened. And you could use the knife to sharpen the bone. You could do, get one step removed. You could use the knife to sharpen the bone. Yeah. All right, so long as the metal itself was not touching on a direct level. So the ink composition, non-metallic, and anything that was actually going to touch the parchment, non-metallic. Why would you use a metal yod? The metal yod is used to keep your place. Theoretically, you're not supposed to actually touch the word when using it. This is the big mistake a lot of people make. You're supposed to be pointing to it. And think about it. This ink is raised a little bit from the parchment. So they used a metal yod, which you'll see an example of, often done in the shape of a hand, so your finger is pointing. But the idea was, just as your finger shouldn't touch the words, neither should the metal yod. It was used to keep your place following. But if you keep touching it, what's going to happen? You're going to scrape some of that ink off. It's raised. And every time you use it, if you keep scraping just a little bit of it off, very shortly you're going to need to have the sofa in to repair. Repairs are expensive. And the Torah is considered non-kosher as soon as there's a break in the letter or even a single letter. Remember, 304,000 some odd, I gave you that number. One letter with a break in it renders the whole kosher, the Torah non-kosher for use. Not supposed to be continued usage. Beetles are not kosher by nature. We're given insects or not, with the exception of the grasshopper family. So if anyone would like to munch down on some dried grasshoppers, you can get them online. And the, by the way, in many parts of Europe, they're considered a delicacy, Europe and the Middle East. 
uh, I did get one of my bar mitzvah students one year who said, I will eat that. And I said, okay. And I ordered a package. <laughs> At his bar mitzvah, his mother handed him the package and said, I'm told you just sprinkle it on the salad. He looked at her and absolutely turned white. <laughs> he did not taste them. By the way, I did. I didn't find any taste at all, other than the salt they'd put on them. That was all I could taste when I did it. But locusts, high source of protein in many parts of the world, and they are kosher. But that is the only insect. What was that? <laughs> they actually had them dipped in chocolate. I don't know if you've ever had them, but they do have them. Uh, um, bees are not kosher. The, the honey from the bees are not kosher. Honey from bees is kosher. It's kosher. The bee is not kosher to eat. What it produces is kosher. Genesis, I'm going to give you the English names, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So that's what's in the Torah? That is what the Torah is. It is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. If you take either Old or New Testament, with the exception of translation issues, it's the same. There are some things that are translated very differently in the New Testament. And it has long been one of the issues between Judaism and Christianity about where some of those mistranslations as we see it come in and the changes. But it is the exact same first five books of Moses that you use in both books. No. Entirely separate. Entirely separate. They did not feel they had the same rules, requirements, etc. In the early days, the original scribes of Christianity, for the most part, were monks who worked in scriptatoriums and had different training and different concepts of how to go forward. Okay? I think we've run out of time. Thank you.